Let's break the political talk show mold. Anything worth doing is hard, and that includes being a good citizen. Our mission is to help you be that better citizen by letting you hear about stuff you might not know, which will make everyone think you're so smart, or by giving you a chance to listen to interviews and debates on a wide variety of subjects that might actually allow you to form new opinions in the privacy of your own mind. I'm Justin Oldham, and you are listening to the Politics and Patriotism Show here on the Stitcher Smart Radio Network. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are, and welcome to another civic edition of the Politics and Patriotism Show. In this half-hour-long episode, we're going to take an entirely different look at what it means to go to war and what it means to come home from war. I'm about to share with you a conversation that I had with author and anthology editor Roy Scranton. He's worked together with his co-editor Matt Gallagher to put together a short story collection that I think is worthy of your attention. Now hold on, don't be so fast to reach for the pause button because this is no froofy literary mashup. We're going to talk serious civics, hardcore politics, and genuine patriotism. And the real price tag for all that stuff that our leaders really don't seem to be paying attention to these days. The simple fact of the matter is that we as citizens have got something of a knowledge deficit. There's a real gap between what we know about war and what we understand about war. So get comfortable, because I'm about to help you bridge that divide, and we're going to do it with some very creative fiction. This is Roy Scranton talking about his new anthology, which he helped co-edit with Matt Gallagher. This is Fire and Forget, published by DeCapo Press in February of 2013. My name is Roy Scranton, and I'm uh, talking today about uh, Fire and Forget, which is an anthology of short stories by veterans of Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, I'm a veteran myself. I served in the U.S. Army from 2002 to 2006, um, in Iraq specifically from 2003 to 2004. Since getting out of the Army, I've gone back to school and finished my bachelor's degree, and I'm working on a PhD now. Uh, and I've also been writing and working on a novel and putting this collection together with my co-editor, Matt Gallagher. Uh, I originally grew up in Oregon and currently live in New Jersey. You know, every anthology has its own origin story, and very few of them ever get told. So please tell us the origin story behind Fire and Forget. What circumstances led to the creation of this thing? I, I'd be happy to, Justin. Uh, Fire and Forget uh, was born in the White Horse Tavern in New York. It's a, it's a storied literary tavern. There's pictures of Norman Mailer and Jack Kerouac and Dylan Thomas on the wall. And what happened there was that a few of us, uh, there, were, there was a small community of veteran writers in New York, and we were trading our stories back and forth. We'd met at the New York University Veterans Writers Group. And as we traded our stories and, and read our material, we realized that we had something, that we had something, you know, something in the material, something in the voice that needed to get out there. And it was something people wanted to hear. The kinds of stories we didn't see being told, you know, in, in the memoirs and reportage that were out, some of which was very good, but it just wasn't the, the kind of close emotional detail we wanted to get at. So we sent out a call for submissions. We reached out to some of our friends and, and we tried to bring together some of the strongest voices, some of the strongest writers coming out of Iraq and Afghanistan uh, as veterans and put them together in an anthology. In an anthology. You know, just give us a little bit more background about yourself. What was your MOS when you were in the military? I was a 13 Papa 1-0, uh, and then later a 2-0 because I got promoted to sergeant. Uh, so for your listeners who may or may not know what that means, I was fire direction control for the multiple launch rocket system. 
Uh, it's a giant tracked vehicle that shoots a, a rocket about 30 kilometers behind enemy lines. And my job was to tell that rocket launcher where to shoot. Funny thing, though, you know, the, the military uh, put in a lot uh, to train me how to do that. But then when we went to Iraq, of course, I didn't do that at all. I spent most of my time in Iraq driving a Humvee, doing patrols, you know, sometimes doing uh, coordinate searches in neighborhoods and different things like that. You know, one of the things that I've noticed just in my lifetime as I've paid attention to people who served in a conflict and then and then went to write about it afterwards is that there are certain commonalities to the process and part of that involves first going through the whole introspection thing deciding what you want to say about it and then how you are going to say it so uh, I want to tell people that you have a short story in this collection it's the very last one at the end it's uh, Red Red Steel India so I want to ask you how did you go through the process of that journey how did you come to the decision after your military service that hey I want to write about this well I was uh, I was writing before I went into the military uh, and uh, and when I was coming out after Iraq and coming out of the military it seemed important to me to get my experience down on paper and and to use it to you know maybe tell a story about a bigger story about a war and the world as, as I see it, I guess. My story, Red Steel India, In Fire and Forget, is just one tiny part of a much larger project, a, a novel I wrote. And that novel has three different parts. Uh, and the middle part, uh, which is which follows an American soldier, uh, is what the story in this book is from. And how I came to sort of to, to decide on the form of that is that I wanted to, in this story particularly, in this section particularly, I wanted to, to do a kind of minimalism. I wanted to, to uh, you know, erase a lot of the explanation and reflection and just present moments of, of dialogue and absurdity. And also, you know, key to this was wanting to present war as a job. A lot of times with war stories, right, it's about a certain event that happens or it's about there's a, there's a sort of climax and a catharsis. I wanted to look at that part of war, you know, where you don't necessarily get that, you know, the part of war that happens every day. And my story is about people on, on gate guard. And so it's about that kind of experience of war where you desperately want something exciting to happen because you're bored out of your mind. Um, but at the same time, the last thing you want is for something exciting to happen because it means, you know, somebody's bleeding on the ground. And so trying to get at that and, and how people make meaning out of that situation was, was what I was trying to do with that story. I think that what you just said there, trying to make meaning out of the thing, I think that is part and parcel of the writer's journey when it comes to what the soldier is trying to do when they're trying to put these things on paper. I'm a, the son of a, a military officer. My dad did three tours in Vietnam as a helicopter pilot. I've been around the military community for my whole life. A after I got out of college, I went on to be a civil servant for a while, and now I'm a, a full-time writer and talk show host. And I have had a chance over the years to help a number of veterans put their thoughts down on paper. And it's interesting that you talk about war as a job, because a number of them have said the very same thing to me. And I note that the people that I've helped put their thoughts on paper, none of these people I've helped, none of them have published, but they felt better afterwards. They got something out of it. And I would like you to talk to our audience about the importance of that because I don't think most people understand the value of catharsis. I think there's something really, really important about writing and about writing one's own experiences, you know, whether it's for publication or not. 
I, I, you know, I, I point to uh, E.B. Sledge's great memoir with the old breed. It's his memoir about uh, being a Marine in the South Pacific in World War II. And uh, he just he wrote it for his family to explain what had happened to him there and what it, what it was like there. And he wrote it years, decades after, after he was there. And it's a tremendous, tremendous piece of work. He never intended it for publication, but it's, it's one of the best memoirs of the South Pacific we have. I think it's immensely valuable for individuals and for the rest of us, for us collectively, for the historical record that, that people write, write down their experiences. Um, but there's also, there's another thing beyond that even that I think is, is extremely valuable. And I think it's something a lot of the writers, I, I know it's something a lot of the writers in this collection are invested in, which is to not just record, but also to create and to create a great story, to really tell a good story. I think there's a there's a sense of craftsmanship and there's a sense of pleasure in the in the skill and the construction of a story that I think is uh, pretty important. We need to pause for a short commercial break, and when we come back on the other side, I'd like you to tell our audience more about what's in this book. I'm Luke Herbert, and this program is supported by 3FeetRadio.com. Which um, stories would you care to comment on for the next few minutes just to give our listeners a sense of what's in this book? We don't need to walk everybody through everything, but just kind of tease them a little. Give them a sense of what's in these pages. Well, there's a variety of stories in, in Fire and Forget, and I think that's the single most important thing is that is that no two stories are exactly alike, and each of them is distinctly memorable. We have homecoming stories, like Siobhan Fallon's story, Tips for a Smooth Transition, which is told from the military wife's point of view, uh, when her husband comes home from his third uh, or fourth deployment, and she you know, doesn't quite know what to expect, because he's a little different every time. And She's a little worried because she had a, you know, a, a passing flirtation with another man that never went anywhere, but she's still frightened that uh, he, he, her husband's worried about her and that he may have heard something, and she doesn't know what he's done when he's been away. And the way that Siobhan sort of opens up that relationship from her, from the, from the military wife's point of view, gives a, a much a needed and a, and a valuable perspective on on the sort of traditional homecoming tale, um, but we also have you know stories that are actually you know happening downrange. So there was there's my story that we mentioned, which is on a gate guard on a on a fob in Iraq, and we also have uh, for example Ted Janice's story Raid, which is what it says on the tin. It tells the story of a raid. Uh, these rangers go on in Afghanistan um, to to take out a, a, a house, and you know one of one of the rangers gets killed. Things don't go exactly right, and the narrator of that story is, is a medic who's been doing this for too long for him, and it's a reflection on on how this constant violence is is wearing on him and wearing on him. The one story I would I, I always like to talk about because it's such a fun story and it's so well done is Gavin Kovite's story um, when engaging targets remember and this story is uh, is about a gunner in a Humvee on on a convoy and the remarkable thing about Gavin's story is that it's a choose your own adventure story so Gavin puts you the rear in the gunner's seat and you have to decide when a ID goes off and a car comes at your convoy, whether or not to shoot this this vehicle. The vehicle might contain a bomb. It might contain a family. You don't know, and you have to make that decision in the story. That's just one example. Those are just a couple examples of the variety of uh, approaches and uh, and stories that we get in Fire and Forget. I like those examples. I was able to make the uh, connection myself with uh, Siobhan Fallon's piece. My mother said that after my father came home from his third tour that she had to get to know him all over again but the good news was he was a lot of fun to get to know in the first place so it everything worked out but unfortunately for a lot of people things don't work out so positively there you mentioned 
when engaging targets, remember. Are, uh, the thing I really liked about that, I've got a number of books in my uh, my collection here that have been used at the uh, uh, for officer training, uh, you know, squad, and and other things like this. This choose your own adventure type thing has been used in, in textbooks for quite a few years now. And this guy's making a point that in a war zone, sometimes there is no good choice. What seems perfectly rational in the moment, no matter which choice you make, it does not always have a good outcome. And I think that's useful for people to know because in every single story, there is a human element to all of this, and the outcomes are not always what we expect, and that's important, because every time we turn on the TV or the radio or we pick up the newspaper, what we as civilians see of a war, its names, its dates, its places, and it's so very easy to forget that there are human beings on the other end of that, and those are our human beings wearing our uniforms. Yeah, I think that's that's exactly right, Justin, and and I I really appreciate the the point you make about you know that that these are that these are people you know making making hard decisions and and just like you say they're making decisions where there there may not be any good answer like there's a bad answer and then there's another bad answer and how people make these decisions how they have to, how they live with them is is what these stories in Fire and Forget are about. Um, I, you know, I would point to to another one if I if I might. I would uh, point to Roman Skaskew's story, Television, uh, which which is about a young lieutenant in Iraq uh, who has to deal with the aftermath of uh, of his sergeant having shot uh, a young Iraqi kid, and uh, he has to you know take his sergeant, and they have to go out on the mission, and he has to apologize to the family and give them the information on where the Iraqi kid is at. Um, and, you know, what what happens in, in Roman story is, is Lieutenant's trying to reconcile this, you know, this mission he has to do, um, dealing with the aftermath of, of a decision um, that that is that was a bad decision, but it was no worse than the other decisions. Um, and he has to reconcile that with the his understanding of war that he brought to Iraq, which is sort of, you know, the understanding that, that we all have uh, that we get from television and movies and, and novels. Um, and, uh, you know, sort of exploring that tension and, and following, you know, following people as they, as they live with the consequences of, of those difficult decisions is really at the heart of this book. Yeah. And I do think that's the real social merit of the thing, because in the modern context, there's so much that we don't see. It's not just a question of sanitized war. I'm old enough to remember how the coverage of Vietnam started and how it finished. And by the time it wrapped up, the terminology of the war had changed and people were talking in the media about the concept of sanitized war and now here we are in 2013 and there are so many things we simply don't see and there in the in the introduction to the book uh, Colin McCann makes light of the fact that we don't even see the coffins come home anymore that's right that's a, that's a, a serious issue and and the sort of there's definitely been some censorship going on about these wars but there's something else as well which is that quite a lot of information out there and a lot of it is just you know i think a lot of times it's things that we don't want to spend that much time thinking about or that are hard for us to think about paul fussell uh, in his in his great uh, book of criticism about world war 1 poetry makes the point that why would anyone want to be shaken or or disturbed or uh, have their you know, have their worldview torn asunder when they don't have to be. And he's talking about why, why people, you know, sometimes are, are resistant to the literatures of war. Sometimes people are resistant to even, you know, finding out or even reading what's there. And I think, you know, I mean, I think that's the case if you look back over Iraq, you know, and Afghanistan, and you look at things like, you know, Abu Ghraib and Haditha and Fallujah too, and, you know, on and on. And 
and and the way that these these wars have impacted you know the lives of our soldiers and marines a lot of times i think we've we've been inclined to turn away but i think one of the great values of fiction is that it creates a space you know fiction like with writing getting things out on the page fiction sort of creates a space between you between the reader and what's on the page it allows us to inhabit emotions and events that would be too terrifying and traumatic to deal with otherwise um and and i think that's that's a real gift that fiction can give us to sort of to live in stories that are, are are maybe too intense to deal with as what happened. You know, I want to make one thing perfectly clear here. I am absolutely not a pacifist. I come from a long line of soldiers, and I appreciate the value of what that profession does. And uh, if I were not disabled as I am, I would serve today. And what I am trying to do here by bringing interviews like this to our audience is I'm trying to put the spotlight on all of the concerns that you've just mentioned. Yes, it is very easy for us to turn away, but I think that in so many respects today, we have a media and an infotainment apparatus that reflexively chooses to not show us these things. And because we don't know they're out there, we don't look for them. I mean, I can tell you that when we air interviews like this, our email box just, it, it gets it gets very busy and we get people saying, hey, I didn't know about this, thanks. And the fact that we get that kind of feedback tells me that, yeah, sure, you know, some people will be turned off by this, but other people thought well enough about it, they got enough food for thought out of it, that it was worth their time to reach for the keyboard for just two or three seconds to say, hey, thanks, do more of that. And that's why we're here. Absolutely. And and having that conversation, you know, the more we can talk about, you know, how these wars happened and, and how how they affected people's lives, uh, how what how those decisions got made, you know, how, how we can uh, deal responsibly with, you know, American power. You know, I'm, I'm not a fat, I'm not a pacifist either, you know, but it's hard to look back at you know that the eight year occupation of iraq and and think that and feel like it was it was done well because because it wasn't but yeah having that conversation opening up that conversation really talking about the human effect of these decisions and uh, opening up how big decisions affect little lives i mean not not that any of these lives are little but you know you know one one thing that was important absolutely central for fire and forget was you know again to return to this this idea of many perspectives. Uh, it was really important for us to have many different stories, many different voices. There's a wide range of, of attitudes and positions in this book. And that seemed important too, because, you know, as we do look back and try to make sense out of the last decade of, of war in, in, in the world, you know, there's not just one story. There's not just one uh, narrative that, that we can tell and then be done with it. There, there are countless narratives. There are thousands of them. Um, and that's, you know, I, that's an important part of the work I, I hope Fire and Forget's doing is to, is to, you know, tell many stories and to open up many stories and to, to open up exactly like you said, to open up this conversation and to keep it going and, and to bring out different viewpoints that maybe people hadn't heard or weren't aware of or weren't out there in the media. Oh, I agree. And I think that from the civic standpoint, because I'm very big on civics, and as a matter of fact, that's the whole reason why the show has the title that it does, because we want to make the civic point that what goes on with the whole application of force is that it really should be the absolute last resort, because it has these consequences, and by showing this to the civilian population, hopefully that trickles up to the elected leadership at the top. That's that's definitely you know that's definitely part of the the general hope you know with fire and forget is that it just will make people think more about you know what what happened in the last ten years and then and that maybe you know next time there's next time we face a moment like like what happened ten years ago with the invasion of Iraq. Uh, there will be more more thought 
um, and more consideration. But it's the the collection isn't specifically political in intent. It's uh, in any way. Um, you know, one of our contributors is a pacifist. He's a conscientious objector. Most of our most of our other contributors are not. Uh, but it's really to open up that that variety of perspectives and and open up the conversation about about what these wars mean and what war means and what military service means and what it means to come home, what it means to bring that stuff back and to try to explain it to other people and try to talk to other people about it. Do you anticipate working on another project like this at some point in the future? Well, I'll tell you, I just uh, initiated and and curated a a somewhat similar project that ran in the New York Times last week. That project was called uh, A War Before and After, and it was nonfiction, so it it, it wasn't fiction stories, but they were short memoir pieces by 16 veterans of the Iraq War, actually 15. 15 veterans of the Iraq War and one veteran from Afghanistan. It was to commemorate or to mark the the 10 year anniversary of our invasion of Iraq. And and with each piece, what each writer did was remember where they were on March 20th, 2003, when the Iraq War began, and then remember for us where they were on December 15th, 2011, when the last U.S. troops left. And what, what you get with those those 16 pieces uh, that were published over the course of the week online and, and in, the, and in the, the newspaper is a, is a kind of mosaic of identities, mosaic of lives, and how, you know, the military service in Iraq sort of cuts through all of them and how it it leaves a mark and also also a reflection on on what that what that period of american history means to us in our in our personal lives i need to take one more commercial break for this episode and when we come back i'd like to talk to you about the long-term civic value of fiction like this and then wrap up by asking you about what veterans can do if they want to follow in your footsteps how do they get started with fiction like this This program is brought to you by ShadowFusionBooks.com. And I do think there's a lot of really good time capsule value there because this type of war, this style of war, I think will be with us for the remainder of the century. And I can easily see mid-century citizen soldiers as they look back on this period, as they're looking for touchstones, asking themselves, hey, has anybody else felt this, done this, seen this? When they find projects like Fire and Forget, it will be something comforting to them. It will be not just military wisdom. It will not just be comradeship and commiseration. It'll be a certain degree of validation. That's our hope, Justin, is to, is to, to have these, you know, have these works reflect the veterans' experience and, and give, you know, for in the future when other citizen soldiers, other veterans, you know, look back or, or when our own generation does when we're older, um, but it's also, you know, it is very much also about uh, trying to bridge uh, w- what seems to be a, a distinct gap right now between civilian and military culture. And you've you've probably encountered this if you're from a military family. You know, most most civilians don't have a, a strong idea of what life in the military is like, or or what happens overseas when people are deplo- are deployed. You know, connecting that experience over there. And over here, and and doing that for civilian audiences is is a key uh, a key thing we're interested in. Okay, well, I'd like to thank you very much for your time, and ask you just to wrap up here. If anybody's interested in doing what you're doing here, what resources should they be looking for? Well, the you know the the first thing I would say to to vets who are who want to write or want to get their experiences down um or even just veterans who have who have come back um are trying to make sense out of you know the the divide between their life downrange and their life here 
uh, in the U.S., the first thing I would say would be to find other veterans. This collection, as I said at the, at the beginning, came about because, you know, a bunch of us veterans got together in New York, started sharing our work with each other. It, the Fire and Forget is a, is a sort of testament to solidarity and solidarity of, of veterans finding each other and talking to each other. So that would be the, the A number one thing I would say to do. From that, you know, from there, once you have a group of people and you can support each other and, and work with each other, anything is possible. That is so very true, but unfortunately, we have come to the end of another very fast half hour. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you like what you heard here today, you can go to politicsandpatriotism.com, where we have lots more author interviews just like this one. And if you're interested, you can subscribe to our past episodes by clicking on the RSS feed from our main page. Or you can go to the iTunes store and download all of our past episodes for free. Or from the main page of our website, you can click on the show blog and you can look for a listing of all of our past author interviews, which will include book reviews. We also have for you, thanks to the nice people at Stitcher Smart Radio Network, an MP3 player on the main page, which will allow you to just click and listen to our episodes from the main page without having to have any other technology at all. Or you can go to Stitcher.com and download any of their free apps, which will allow you to listen to our show via your tablet, your smartphone, or your Android device, wherever you might happen to be on this green earth. So on behalf of everyone here at the show, thank you for your time and have a good day.